Just letting all you know that the uh, convocation will start in about 12 minutes. Uh, please be patient. Thank you.
Good morning, Jeff. Uh, everyone's on mute. We're just waiting for a convocation to start. Great. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Test.
All right, just stand by though, okay? Thank you for patiently waiting. The convocation will start in approximately five minutes. Thank you for patiently waiting. The convocation will begin in approximately two minutes.
Good morning, Board of Education members, faculty, and staff. Happy New Year to you all. Once again, we have a new school year ahead of us filled with hope and excitement for a fresh beginning and of all we can accomplish together. Two years ago, our theme for the year was we're better together. Since that time, we've had to take care of ourselves, push ourselves, redefine how we teach and work and care for one another to make it through the year of COVID-19. This year is going to be another big year, likely filled with more unknowns, but I am confident Cromwell educators will do whatever it takes. You are a remarkable team. So our theme for this year is together, we're better 2.0. We will work together to improve and get better at we do to support each other and our students. Last year, we worked hard at teaching our students remotely, honing our technology skills, and finding the best ways to teach our students virtually, in person, and via hybrid. We had to rely on each other for help when we were stuck or needed to figure things out on the fly. Maybe the craziness of pandemic teaching and working helped us come out of hiding. As adults, we spend a lot of time masking and hiding things that we don't necessarily know how to do or do well. I'm sure there have been other instances when you felt you had to present yourself as an expert when really you were feeling your way and doing the best that you could to learn on the job. I distinctly remember attending my final interview with the superintendent when I wanted to be the associate superintendent in Middletown. There was a performance task where I had to analyze data, put it on spreadsheets with charts and graphs, and do a succinct PowerPoint presentation on the data. I had no qualms about analyzing the data, but creating Excel spreadsheets with formulas and graphs was not in my comfort zone. Of course, I prepped and practiced, but this presentation was for a new superintendent I did not know. To counteract the unknowns, I dressed in my most professional outfit, polished my nails, and my discussions of various curricula went strong on the interpersonal skills, education law, the current educational strategies, and definitely donned my most powerful antiperspirant. It takes a lot of effort to cover up a weakness and manage someone else's impressions. I wanted the job and wanted to show my best self. We are not comfortable wearing our weaknesses on our sleeve. There is actually research in a book called An Everyone Culture, Becoming a Deliberately Developmental Organization, which talks about everyone having to do a second job that no one is teaching us or paying us to do. So we try to cover up our weaknesses, try to look our best and make good impressions. The ultimate cost in this situation is that neither the organization nor its people are able to realize their full potential. We want to be a school system that creates a culture in which everyone could overcome their own internal barriers to change and use errors and vulnerabilities as prime opportunities and professional growth. I see it as Cromwell Public Schools Together 2.0. We have to, courage, we have to take risks, we have to make mistakes, accept that we are not good at everything and admit it. We teach our students about a growth mindset, self-efficacy and resilience. We encourage our students to do this, but do we practice what we preach? There are important assumptions in creating deliberately de developmental organizations. It is critical to actively seek and value professional growth and to create opportunities within our work for that growth to occur. Together, we will look for ways to help staff get the most out of giving and receiving feedback, coaching, and ways to improve their practice. Developing our schools and our staff is a symbiotic relationship. They depend on each other. It is definitely going to be another adventurous year for all of us, especially our students. However, I am convinced 
that if we continue to learn and grow together, we can make the strides we need to make to create a safe and rigorous learning and working environment for all adults and for all students. Next, I would like to introduce Cromwell Board of Education Chairperson Jeff Matrullo. Chairperson Matrullo has been an unwavering advocate for Cromwell Public Schools for many years, and we thank him greatly for his courageous leadership during a global pandemic. Chairperson Matrullo is not seeking re-election for the new school year, but I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank him for everything he has done for the Cromwell Public Schools community over the past eight years as a member of the Board of Education. His calm and respectful demeanor, his strong desire to do well by all students and staff, staff, and his integrity will be greatly missed. Please join me in wishing Chairperson Matrullo the very best as he will now be able to spend more time with his beautiful family. Mr. Matrullo, we look forward to continuing to educate Andrew and Matthew in our school system. And we know that we can also continue to count on you to be one of our greatest supporters. Welcome, Chairperson Matrullo. Thank you, Dr. Macri, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to this year's convocation. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Jeff Matrullo. After growing up in Rhode Island and living a short while in Hartford and Bloomfield, I moved to Cromwell in 2009, where I have since lived with my wife, Danielle, herself a teacher, and two children, Andrew and Matthew. Andrew will start fourth grade at WIST this year, and Matthew was not quite ready for ECS uh, next year, though. I have served on the Board of Ed since 2013, and I'm honored to serve alongside the other eight members of the board, Lori Cantwell, John Flanders, Selena Kelleher, Jen Lamberson, Lou Menendez, Lindsay Murley, Dipti Post, and Catherine Russ. Because I do not often have the opportunity to address you, I first want to personally thank you for all of your efforts during the last school year. We all know the difficulties of last year. Between the different learning formats, to new technology, to traffic jams in our parking lots, every day presented its new and own challenges. Despite those unique challenges, the district pulled together and kept moving forward. And we could not have done that without the efforts of each district employee. Last year exemplified the power of teamwork and I proudly call Cromwell my team. Last year proved that you truly are essential to the community. As we know, the world changes quickly. So now we need to turn the page to this year. In fact, I started writing this in June and have had to rewrite and modify it several times as the circumstances surrounding COVID changed. Whereas in late June, I had focused on the message of returning to a mostly normal school year based on the news at that time, that message faded when the news started going in a different direction later in the summer. So much for planning ahead. I should have heeded the message I learned early in my career. Change is the only constant. So at that backdrop, Welcome to the 2021-2022 school year. I wish I could tell you exactly how this year would go, but I wouldn't bet any money on my predictions. And for the record, I wouldn't bet on anyone else's long-term predictions either. They probably have a shorter shelf life than a bottle of milk. But here is what I would bet on. I would bet that no matter the challenges, no matter what the news says in any given morning, no matter what Dr. Macri asks of you, the dedicated people of our schools will once again rise to the challenge and make it work, whatever the it may be. As you always do, you will find a way and you will perform the task with the professionalism and commitment that the community has come to know from our schools. Knowing as we do that some change will happen this year, perhaps even for circumstances not yet conceivable, we need to prepare in advance for that change as best as we can while keeping the focus where it belongs, on our students who are now entering a third school year that COVID will affect. Now more than ever, we need to live out our mission statement of placing students first. In these unpredictable times, we must accept change as a reality, 
but we cannot compromise our responsibility and commitment to our students, even among the noise from outside influences. Under the leadership of Dr. Macri and our district's administration, I am confident that we have the skills and resolve sitting right here in this convocation to meet whatever challenges this year has to offer. And continuing on the theme of change, I can surely say that next year you will have a different chairperson addressing you at this time. As Dr. Macri just mentioned, my term expires in November and I have made the difficult and personal decision not to seek reelection. I am grateful for all of your professionalism and camaraderie over the past eight years. I have truly enjoyed the opportunity and privilege to serve this community and I wish nothing but the best for the incoming Board of Education members and new chair. And speaking of community, I would like to welcome all of our new teachers and staff to Cromwell. I trust that you will find that Cromwell defines community, welcoming, supportive, and close-knit. If you ever need anything, please ask. We never have a shortage of people willing to lend a helping hand. As we embark on whatever this year has to offer, I want to thank you again for all of your dedication to our schools, district, and students. And good luck and best wishes for a successful school year. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson Matrulo. As a superintendent, we all wish and hope to work with a board chair of your caliber and character. I've been incredibly blessed to have that opportunity. As I explain you to many people, I call you the salt of the earth. And I truly mean that. Thank you for everything you have done to support all of us, especially me during very difficult times at all hours of the day and night. I wish you the very best. You will be missed, but I'm sure I will still be calling on you. You're welcome. And Next, thank you. thank you. Next, Dr. McLean would like to take a few moments to celebrate our staff who have been dedicated to the Cromwell Public Schools for many years and welcome our new staff members to our team. Dr. McLean. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2021-22 school year. I have the pleasure this morning of introducing our staff, our new staff, and celebrating our staff that has been committed to Cromwell Public Schools. All right, I have to. Oops, oops, oops. There we go. Okay. First is Nicole Amayo. She's going to be a cafeteria manager for Cromwell Middle School. She loves spending time with her family and her two dogs and taking walks. Amy Arnista is our new pre K to 12 literacy curriculum supervisor. She did her undergraduate at UConn and did her graduate work at Central and at Sacred Heart University. She likes to read, go to the beach, and out to dinner with friends. Nadine Ashley is our new fourth grade teacher at Woodside Intermediate School. She did her undergraduate work at Eastern and has a master's degree that she did at Sacred Heart University. She likes playing with her two dogs, Colby and Kaya. She likes puzzles, crosswords, and Sudoku. Joseph Asmus is our new physical education and health teacher for Cromwell High School. He has his degree from Central Connecticut State University, um, likes playing fetch with his dog Kodak and lifting in his basement. Christine Barilaro is our new special ed, special education teacher at Cromwell Middle School. She did her undergraduate work at Central and has a master's from Capella University. She likes all things British, Downtown Abbey, Bridgerton, The Crown, and also baking. Courtney Benamar is a, our new food service worker at Cromwell Middle School. She likes to clean and knit. Ramsey Bennington, assistant principal for Cromwell High School. She did her undergraduate work at St. 
Joseph's College and did her graduate work at Central Connecticut State University. She loves to vacation and to read. Jennifer Browning is a new special education teacher at Woodside Intermediate School. She has her undergraduate in psychology from the University of Phoenix and did her graduate work at Central Connecticut State University. She likes cake making and decorating and music. Carol Cam Barreri is a new paraprofessional at Edna C. Stevens. She likes shopping and to cook. Sophie Sestari is our new French teacher at Cromwell High School. She has a bachelor's in French from Central Connecticut State University and a master's from Wesleyan University. She likes hiking, biking, traveling in the, in the US and in Europe. Um, she enjoys zombie and suspense movies, listening to audiobooks, especially paranormal, romance, biographical, historical fiction genre. Joshua Toblowski is our new social studies teacher at Cromwell Middle School. He did his undergraduate work at Providence College. He enjoys running and he's been making jewelry for about six years. Trisha Corso is our new cafeteria manager at Edna C. Stevens School. She enjoys hot yoga. She makes soaps, lotions, and face washes. Heather Dillon is a new food service worker for Edna C. Stevens School as well. I enjoy the beach and soccer and her dog there. Claudia Emanuel is a new paraprofessional at Woodside. She loves reading, the theater, and theme shows and being in them. Dr. Gail Immelson is our new science teacher for Cromwell Middle School. She did her undergraduate work at Northeastern and her graduate work at Yale, and she likes hiking and Irish dance. Mary Ellen Fledge is a new paraprofessional at Edna C. Stevens School. She likes reading and decorating with vintage and thrift items. Graham Jerry is our new secondary literacy coach for CHS and CMS. He did his undergraduate work at UConn and his graduate work at the University of Bridgeport and Central Connecticut State University. He's a music enthusiast and played, has played in a couple bands and he likes to cook. James Galanto is our new food service worker at Edna C. Stevens School. He enjoys cooking, reading and swimming. Samantha Goodson is our social worker at Edna C. Stevens School. She did her undergraduate at Southern Connecticut State University and her graduate work at UConn. She loves the beach and hiking with her dog, Tucker. Jess Gregoric is our new pre-K to 12 special education supervisor. She did her undergraduate at Keene State University and her graduate work at St. Joseph's College and CCSU. She likes to go to the beach and spending time with her family. Kristen Hoffman is our new eighth grade math teacher for Cromwell Middle School. She did both her undergraduate and graduate work at Central Connecticut State University. She likes to practice and teach aerial silks and she loves to sew. Nicole Janus is our new social, grade eight social studies teacher at Cromwell Middle School. She did her undergraduate at UConn and her graduate work at CCSU. She loves to travel, trying local foods. And even though winter is her least favorite season, she likes winter sports, hiking, snowboarding, and figure skating. Andrew Cuckle is our new Cromwell High School principal. He did his undergraduate work at UConn and his gradual work, graduate work at the University of Bridgeport and the University of New Haven. He loves antiques and the beach and spending time with his twin girls. Julie Kubek is our new cook and cashier at Cromwell Middle School. She likes having date time with her daughter and husband and listening to music and working out. Samantha Lindquist is our grade five teacher, is our new grade five teacher at Woodside Intermediate School. She did her undergraduate work at UConn and has a master's in curriculum and instruction from UConn. She's never eaten meat and she has dual citizenship. Christina Mackey is a special education teacher at Cromwell High School. She did her undergraduate work at CCSU and her master's work at, again, CCSU. She's a track and field coach and fan, and she likes photography. 
Leah Madison is our new social worker for Cromwell High School. She did her undergraduate and graduate work at UConn, and she enjoys traveling, health, and wellness. Carly Mahoney is our new BCBA. She did her undergraduate work at Central Connecticut State University and her master's at University of Cincinnati. She enjoys playing with her four-year-old daughter, Daphne, and in her spare time, she crafts and makes custom t-shirts and apparel. Robert Maxa is our new custodian for Cromwell High School. He loves people and sports. Leah Mazzarella is our new Spanish teacher for Cromwell High School. She has a bachelor's degree from Quinnipiac and a graduate degree from Quinnipiac. She enjoys reading and spending time with her son and two dogs. Melinda Marchesi is a new grade four teacher at Woodside Intermediate School. She has her undergraduate work from Central <clears throat> Connecticut State University and is working towards her master's at Central right now. She enjoys photography and scrapbooking, hiking and spending time outdoors. Sydney Meehan is a new psychologist for WIS and ECS. She did her undergraduate at Southern and did her graduate work at Fairfields. She's obsessed with her dog, Phoebe, and she loves working out. Andrea Middlebrooks is our new secondary numeracy coach at CHS and CMS. She did her undergraduate work at Payne College and her graduate work at University of New England and at Central Connecticut State University. She's a volunteer coach in Newington and she likes to sing. She has three children, Jalen, Jordan, and Julian, and they keep her very busy. Sean Miller is a new French teacher for Cromwell Middle School. He did his undergraduate work at UConn, both his undergraduate and graduate work at UConn. He's a huge sports fan and he loves to travel. Anthony Morse is a new social studies teacher at Cromwell Middle School. He did his undergraduate at Central Connecticut State University. He's a musician and he enjoys lawn care and equipment. Rebecca O'Connor is our new capstone teacher at Cromwell High School. She did her undergraduate work at UConn and her graduate work at St. Joseph's College. She loves going to the beach and reality TV and spending time with her family. Amanda Palmer is a grade four teacher at Woodside Intermediate School. She has her undergraduate degree from Central Connecticut State University and loves travel and gardening. Catherine Pember is a school nurse at Cromwell Middle School. She has her degree from Southern Connecticut State University. She enjoys beaching and boating in Cape Cod and running and has been in some marathons. Rebecca Rod Rodriguez is our new special education teacher at Cromwell High School. She has both her undergraduate and graduate degrees from Central Connecticut State University, and she enjoys running and hiking. Allison Ryan is a third grade teacher at Woodside Intermediate School. Both of her degrees are from Eastern Connecticut State University, and she enjoys gardening and binge watching on Netflix. Julie Shepard is our new pre-K to 12 numeracy curriculum supervisor. She has both of her degrees from um, Central Connecticut State University, and she loves running, exercise, and the beach. Samantha Shuko is our reading teacher for next year. Um, she did her undergraduate at Syracuse University and her graduate work at Southern Connecticut State University. She loves spending time with her family and she sings in a rock choir and she scrapbooks in her spare time. Kelly Swan Romanek is our district data and website management coordinator. She loves the outdoors and the beach. Nicole Van Bakoven is our new special education teacher at Cromwell Middle School. She has her degrees from St. Joseph University and she likes to listen to music and to read. All right, now we're gonna switch gears and we're going to celebrate the people that have dedicated 20 years or more to the Cromwell Public Schools. First is James and Nino, and he is a paraprofessional at CMS. Jess Gregoric is our new special education supervisor. Catherine Gazzardi is our CHS attendant secretary. Maureen Mandeville is, ECS, is, our, is an ECS preschool teacher. Rebecca Stillman, a guidance counselor at Cromwell High School. Melanie Winook is our WIS special education teacher. Congratulations and thank you so much for your service to Cromwell Public Schools. 
And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Macri to celebrate our Teachers of the Year. Congratulations and welcome to all of our new staff. As you can tell, uh, Dr. McLean and I both can't fit in this screen. We wanted to do it together, but there's only room for one of us. But I congratulate you and I welcome you and I congratulate all of our teachers and staff members who have devoted their lifelong commitment to the Cromwell Public Schools. Next, I am very proud to announce our Teachers of the Year. From ECS, Ms. Jillian Raffone. From WIS, Mr. Dan D'Elia. From CMS, Ms. Karen Bosworth. From CHS, Mr. Adriano Borgia. Congratulations to all four teachers for their passion and commitment to all of our students and our noble profession. Now, let's put our hands together virtually for our District Teacher of the Year, yay, <laughs> Mr. Dandelia. Mr. Dandelia is an exceptional science teacher. His thoughtful planning, inclusionary practices, and high expectations are incredible. He cares deeply about the social and emotional well-being of our children, and he models this each and every day, both in and outside of the classroom. Mr. D'Elia's focus is always on proving the lives of all children. In conversation with parents, staff, and students, his love for teaching, learning, and children is clearly evident. Whether it is for the students of Cromwell or the children he has come in contact with by volunteering in various capacities as a coach, Newtown Board of Ed Vice Chairperson, and as an active member of various committees Mr. D'Elia serves both the students and the community with compassion and humbleness. Mr. D'Elia exhibits every aspect of an extraordinary teacher, mentor, colleague, and those of you that know him, human being. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dan D'Elia to the podium for this well-deserved honor. Mr. D'Elia. Thank you, Dr. Macri. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. Let me adjust the camera so you can see my head. Before I begin, I'd like to take a minute to um, remember Alicia Butler and all of the other members of the Cromwell community that are not with us anymore. So I'm just going to pause for five seconds and we can just remember them, keep them in our hearts, because that's where they'll always stay. Thank you. I'd also like to congratulate Mr. Borgia, Ms. Bosworth, and Ms. Raffone. Mr. Borgia, Ms. Bosworth, Ms. Raffone, I am honored to be in your company. You are exceptional in every way, and it's truly a privilege to be considered in your company and a colleague of yours. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. It's going to take just a few minutes. I, when I was given the honor of, of um, making this speech, I immediately started preparing and I had this wonderful idea. I sent out a survey, I got great responses. I even talked to Dr. McLean about it. I was gonna do a whole story on Seabiscuit. Seabiscuit is my favorite movie. I love horses and I'm inspired by movies. I'm inspired by talent. I'm inspired by a lot of things, inspired mostly by the children, by the way. But um, I had this whole speech planned out. It was perfect. Everybody was going to laugh. We were going to cry. We were going to celebrate. We were going to talk about difficult times, perseverance. It was just, it was wonderful. And then something happened. June 12th. June 12th, my baby boy, Daniel, graduated from high school. It was a wonderful day. It was, a, it was like a cloudy day. We were outside. The weather was perfect. There was a nice breeze. I was sitting there watching the kids walk up, um, young adults. And it was just, it was glorious. I was having the best day. And then someone made a speech. And the speech was about hugs. Hugs. The whole speech. It was about the fact that we couldn't hug anymore because of the pandemic. And I immediately, when that was said, I immediately just became overwhelmed with emotion. 
I just went into this mode. I call it the Charlie Brown mode. Have you ever seen Charlie Brown movies where um, they're in classroom and the teacher's talking and all the teacher's voices, wah, 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 wah. You can't hear, you know. So I kind of went into that mode during the speech and I just started reflecting on the past 20 years um, of, of my children's lives with me. My children are both adopted from Korea. So I, I went all the way back to that day when they arrived and I just, we just, I just started thinking about the successes, the failures, the difficult times, the, the triumphs, and all of that was celebrated with a hug. And it was, it was, it was truly um, a changing moment in my life because I realized so many people had impacted their lives over the last 21 or 18 years that um, I, I hadn't really come to terms with that. And it, it, was, it was just spectacular. So we had a wonderful dinner. We went out. We celebrated Daniel's graduation. And the next day, I said to myself, Seabiscuit's not going to work. Seabiscuit's not going to work. We need to think about all the times that have made a difference for us and the difference that we make for people. And what these memories made me realize is that as teachers and members of the Cromwell community, we help so many people. We give hugs every day. They're not physical hugs. They're hugs of support, encouragement, love. That's what we do. So what I did was I went back and I revisited the survey and I came up, I just, I just grabbed a few, um, of the moments that teachers had shared with me and community members from Cromwell. And I'm just gonna share them with you because I think it's important that we remember why we do what we do. You know, this is our fuel. This is what's in our hearts is what drives us every single day. It, re it really is. And I think it's important for you all to hear and to know that your hearts should be full because you're doing such wonderful work. So I'm just going to share a few with you. Um, a former student said to a teacher, because of you, I am now a teacher. Imagine that. A student said, looked up at a teacher and said, I can't believe it. I can actually read now. A student said to another student in need, um, I, I believe it was in crisis, said, brought the student to someone and said, this person helped me, I know she can help you. Think about how powerful that is, that a student trusts someone so much that they will bring a friend to that person. Another student said, um, and this was kind of funny, um, look at all my mosquito bites. And I, apparently the student always shows the mosquito bites, but then I reflected on that and I thought it was funny at the beginning, but then I realized how safe is that person? How safe does that student feel going to that person and showing that? And, and I mean, that's, that's quite personal, actually, if you think about it. Um, a student said to a teacher, you've helped me grow as a person and as a student. Now, another one, this is one of my, another one that made a big impression on me. I walked over to a student and told them how much they grew. And the student turned and looked at me and said, it's because of you. That's special. I can count so high, aren't you proud of me? A parent who used to be a student said to a teacher, you made such an impression on me. Unfortunately, I didn't realize it until I became a dad. Thank you. And then my, the three that were the most common and, and my favorites personally, you understand me, thank you, and I love you. What an impact you're having, every single one of you. Keep that in your hearts forever. So I'm just going to leave you with one final commentary. Keep doing what you're doing because you're doing it better than anyone else. Keep giving those symbolic hugs because the students need them and so do we. Thank you very much and have a wonderful school year. Thank you, Mr. D'Elia, and congratulations again. Now, 
It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. David Cormier. For those of you that know Dr. David Cormier, he doesn't like all of the stuff that says how wonderful he is. He just wants to be announced as a teacher, a parent, and an administrator. But I'm going to do a little bit more than that because he deserves it. Dr. David Cormier specializes in working with organizations to design and implement effective leadership strategies. Dr. Cormier merges leadership theory with contemporary tools and tactics to encourage leaders at all levels to support coordinated, ongoing, and organizational development. If you've ever heard national speakers speak, they usually use their same speech quite often. I've been lucky enough to hear quite a few of them. That is not the way Dr. David Cormier works. He meets with his constituents, and in this case, Dr. McLean and myself, and talks about what Cromwell Public School students and staff need. And then he works tirelessly to create what we need for our adults so that our students can succeed. Through his innovative workshops, facilitation, on-site coaching, and technical assistance, Dr. Cormier has successfully affected positive changes for his clients on a local, national, and international level. Prior to his leadership consulting engagements, Dr. Cormier served as the assistant director to program development for a statewide resource and training organization. In his capacity, Dr. Cormier collaboratively developed systems and structures to support statewide school improvement initiatives aimed at strengthening teaching and learning practices. He currently addresses classrooms, building and district level improvements through modeling instructional coaching, providing feedback and engaging educators in conversation on effective instruction. In addition to his work with an educational institution, Dr. Cormier also works with nonprofits, healthcare institutions, and government agencies to implement adaptive and transformative improvement. Dr. Cormier has a master's degree in educational leadership, received his doctorate in leadership studies from Andrews University. On a personal and proud note, I was blessed to be the principal of Dave's three amazing and uniquely special children. He is an incredible educator and an unbelievable father and a very, very authentic friend. Dr. Cormier will be capitalizing on the importance for us to build a growth culture for both students and staff. I welcome warmly Dr. David Cormier and hope you enjoy his presentation as much as I have enjoyed working with him over the years. Dr. David Cormier. Well, thank you, Dr. Macri, and thank you, Dr. McLean. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you today. I'm very excited to be here. I wish we were all together in person, um, but I know that uh, as you're back in your buildings or in your classrooms, uh, that you're feeling the kind of energy around uh, inviting new staff members to the, to the school year, uh, celebrating those um, of excellence in relationship to teachers of the year. And so this is just a very exciting, very exciting time. It's hard to believe, though, that we're actually kicking off our 2021-2022 school year. Um, I'm finding it really hard to keep track and judge time since March of 2020. My timelines are, are a little bit fuzzy kind of at best. Um, I actually saw recently this post on Facebook and I thought it really kind of rang true um, to exactly how I was feeling. And that is this, you know, on the left, it's us trying to process 2020. And on the right, it's this weird realization that we are literally just four months away from 2022. The challenge for me is I'm missing a lot of time that seems in between 2020 and 2022. I'm not sure what happened, but here we are at the start of another school year and our back to school kickoff. Um, these back to school sessions are always tough, right? It's, it's that kind of official sign that the summer's over and uh, really kind of thinking about what that means for us as we're mentally preparing for a new school year, all the things that we keep adding to our to-do list over the last week and this week and going into next week. Um, there's just so much to, to, to be able to accomplish uh, in such a short period of time. So that's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure um, because my job is to make you feel inspired at the end of today. Um, and also as you wake and come to work over the next 10 months. 
So that's a ton of pressure. But the good news for me is that inherent in the definition of inspire is this idea that inspiration comes from within and that something um, th within us connects to us. So really, I'm, I guess I'm kind of off the hook. It's, it's not up to me, it's up to you. So if you're not feeling inspired today, it's your own darn fault. Um, but in all seriousness, I see my job this morning really as an opportunity to get you some things to think about um, and some things to stay inspired and to kind of come back to um, over the course of, of this school year. So as we think about um, the, the ideas that Dr. Macri and, and Dr. McLean shared around shifting our focus from 2020 to 2021, where really that theme was, we're better together, meaning we have to stick together. We have to help each other out. Um, we have to take care of one another and that's how we're gonna be successful. Uh, it's just a slight shift in our thinking in terms of this year, being more together, we're better. So how do we capitalize on the fact that we do take care of each other, we do work so well and collaborate as a district to make sure that we have opportunities to take things further, take our learning further around technology implementation, curriculum, um, strategies, relationships, social emotional learning, all the things that we know are important. How do we go to the next level? Kind of that good to great, great to even better mentality. Um, recently, I stumbled across this book, Together is Better, by Simon Sinek, and if you're not familiar with Simon Sinek's work, we'll get more of that a little bit later on this morning, but um, he's also had some phenomenal TED Talks, so I highly recommend you kind of do a quick Google search, if you will, for Simon Sinek's work. Um, but he says, as individuals, we're useless. We can't lift heavy weight. Um, we can't solve problems, but together, we are remarkable. And recently I was uh, listening to a podcast from Brene Brown and she's uh, was kind of quoting a neuroscientist and the neuroscientist was really talking about the biological evidence that we are interdependent um, versus independent. And there's this notion of biologically speaking, we are actually better together. Um, and, you know, kind of aligned with that thinking, this African proverb, I think sums it up quite nicely to go fast, go alone, to go far, go together. And so we really have this opportunity in our work to continue to reinforce and support one another. What I'd like to do is share with you over the course of our time together this morning, five either key levers or foundational things that I think we need to continue to reflect upon and work on and keep in mind as we move forward over the course of the year. So these five things include uh, knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. So as Dr. Macri shared with you early this morning, how important it is for us to have a great understanding for what we're good at, but also those challenge areas and where we need to improve. The second, I kind of call tap into your inner pharmacy, but this is really about the things that we can do from laughing and smiling and, and the importance of relationships. Um, and as your uh, teacher of the year referenced, the importance of the hug and so forth, all of those things really kind of connect to building that uh, biological foundation for the work of, of working together. Cultivating hope, efficacy, positive self-talk, gratitude, all of these things that are coming out of positive psychology, um, really our schools can be case studies for this. It's so important for us to look at aspects around hope and efficacy and positive self-talk, both for our students, but also for us as the adults. Fourth, an opportunity for us to do some reflecting around core values. How do your personal core values connect with the organization's core values and how important that is? And last, I wanna spend some time thinking about social emotional needs, not just of our students, but of one another, and how when we look at the social emotional kind of framework, how interdependent everything is across that framework. Now, just like you experiencing some challenging teaching during the pandemic, um, doing a convocation for several hundred people at the same time, knowing that we can't do breakout sessions um, and we can't uh, have it as interactive as we'd like, we tried to put some things in place to help support that so that it still remains a little bit interactive. Um, so hopefully you have a set of handouts for today. If you'll notice in the PowerPoint uh, slides, you'll see page numbers in the upper right-hand corner. Those should correspond directly to your, to your handouts. The second thing is from time to time, I'll give you some prompts and you'll see this visual of a pencil for you to jot down some thoughts. And so the interaction will come by way of you're doing some reflecting and some jotting of some thoughts. And so you'll see those prompts. We'll do a couple minutes here and there um, just for you to digest some of the information and come up with some ideas for how you can take things further. So each of those five foundational key levers, I'm also going to leave you with, hey, if this was of interest to you and you wanna take this further, here are a couple of recommendations of things that you can explore on your own outside of today's session. I also put together a Google Drive folder with some resources. 
I'll send a link out to uh, Dr. Macri and Mac uh, Dr. McLean to be able to uh, share that with you so that uh, some of these things you can do outside of today will be available to you there. So that first key lever is really about an opportunity for us to know those strengths of ours and know the, the weaknesses or the limitations and things that we can do to get better. Um, knowing ourselves is intelligence, knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength, mastering yourself is true power. Um, you know, this quote really resonates with me and it's about self-awareness. It's about knowing ourselves. It's about knowing the parts of us that we need to grow um, and the fact that it's ongoing. You know, I'm, I'm rapidly approaching my 30s here. Well, all right, maybe my 50s. I thought I could possibly get away with, Zoom has this awesome um, appearance enhancement feature. I wasn't sure if it was working, but all right, truth be told, approaching my 50s. And I haven't spent a ton of time until probably the maybe past five or 10 years self-reflecting to a degree where I'm really thinking about those areas where I need to grow and trying to put things into place to help support that growth. I want to ask you to do a couple of things in terms of a reflection. So there's four prompts on page two. The first prompt is, what are your strengths as an educator? What are the things that you do really, really well? The second, what did you learn about yourself as a teacher or an educator over the last year and a half? The third, what positive aspect of pandemic teaching will you take with you long after the pandemic? And the fourth, what do you need to improve upon? How do you hope to grow this year? So I'm gonna give you literally two minutes to just jot down a couple of thoughts and then we're gonna come back together. So go ahead, jot down a couple of thoughts. And by the way, if you need to stand up and stretch a little bit, um, wiggle your body a little bit, um, please feel free to do so. So we'll come back together in about two minutes. About a minute left. And if you could start to wrap up the thought that you're working on, we'll come back together. So I want to encourage you to pay particular attention to that first and last question. So the question around your strengths and opportunities for growth. Um, I spent a lot of time working with teachers in instructional coaching capacities where I'm spending time in classrooms and debriefing lessons with classroom teachers. And I think it's been very interesting to me um, the number of teachers, when I ask them about their strengths, either hesitate or really struggle to come up with their strengths. And I think we live in a culture um, to a degree where we do focus on limitations, but we're still not always clear what those limitations are, or more importantly, how do we get better? And so as Dr. Macri referenced, uh, one of these publications uh, is actually the In Everyone Culture. It's a um, Harvard Business publication. And the book actually follows three very different companies. Uh, one is a tech company, one is an entertainment company, and the third is a Connecticut-based hedge fund or investment company. The wife of the director of the company or CEO is actually the founder of the Dalio Foundation, which does a lot of uh, philanthropic work for educators. The companies are very different in relationship to most companies in that they truly do highlight and encourage people to highlight their weaknesses, their limitations, because they want to help people learn and grow. And they do so in such a way where people feel comfortable being vulnerable and, and putting kind of those areas uh, that they need to improve upon um, out in front and center. 
And so um, as Dr. Macri kind of summarized, uh, I, this quote is, is, I think, really true to what we do as educators and what we see in many other types of organizations. Um, but the reference is that people are really actually doing a second job that no one's paying them for. And that job is about covering up their weaknesses. It's about managing people's impressions of them and always showing uh, themselves to their best advantage, which isn't always a bad thing. But when it's taken to extreme and when we're not feeling comfortable sharing our inadequacies or in uncertainties or limitations, then it's going to be very limiting in terms of our opportunities for growth. So when people are hiding their weaknesses, they have left less of a chance to overcome them. Um, so it's really, really critical that we take this idea. And I think teacher evaluation is probably a good example of this, right? If we know our administrators coming in, not that we don't do a bad job um, with other lessons, but we take a little bit of extra effort in planning that lesson, dotting our I's and crossing our T's for the lesson that we might be observed upon versus taking a risk and saying, you know what? I'm really not good at this aspect of teaching. I'm gonna plan a lesson with this in it and get some great feedback that's gonna help me grow. That's not typically how we as educators conceptualize the evaluation process, um, but our community can. We can actually look at shifting and changing that. So I did some reflecting and at one point was kind of thinking maybe instead of better together, we should have changed the name of today's keynote address and really called it, I suck, you suck, it's better to suck together Let's wear our suck on our sleeve. What are those aspects that we need to get better at? Um, and just put them out there and wear them on our sleeve uh, and know that our colleagues are gonna support us in getting better. And I think that's one thing that I took away from everybody that spoke earlier this morning is there's something about Cromwell and the support that you give to one another that hopefully people feel comfortable being vulnerable, putting their suck on their sleeve. And I think Brene Brown says, embrace the suck is kind of one of her mottos and how important that is. We also know that in many cases, when you do that reflecting around your limitations and your strengths, sometimes our weaknesses are our strengths overused. And in some cases, we're also our own worst enemy. Let me show you a quick video clip. Um, and it's a clip that has Sylvester Stallone in it. I never thought I would do this in a training session, but here goes. All right, Donnie, get into your stance. Make a small target, three subways. Okay. You just got here and staring back at you. Yeah. That's your toughest opponent. Every time you get into the ring, that's who you're going against. I believe that in boxing and I do believe that in life. Okay? And throw a jab in the jaw. All right, one to the gut. Now, every time you punch this guy, what's he doing? Start one back at him. That's right. So either you block it, slip it, or get out of the way. So. Leave you two alone for a while. Good luck. So this is from the movie Creed. And that idea of, you see that guy staring back at you, that's your toughest opponent. In many cases, we are our own toughest opponent. And so really thinking about how we self-reflect to a deeper extent and understand what our strengths are and what our challenge areas are. There's an organization, um, it's the VIA Institute for Character, um, and they have developed these 24 character strengths. You can actually go online and for free take the assessment. I think you have to pay for a report, but you can take the assessment for free and, and get some information in connection to your uh, character strengths and challenge areas. And so we have the capacity and we have a degree already of all 24 character strengths. Some we might rate a little bit higher and some a little bit lower, which means that we have some work to do. And so those ranges become important, but there's tremendous benefit to our knowing our character strengths. And it's everything from improved happiness to goal achievement and attainment. And so we can work through this process. And what I'd like to ask you to do now is to take a look on page three. You'll see these 24 character strengths. Even without taking the formal assessment on the website, um, take some time to read through these 24 character strengths and see if you can come up with what you think your top five character strengths are and what you feel perhaps your bottom five character strengths are. And if you have time at the end of this two to three minute reflection, I want you to see if you could come up with a couple of ways that you can use your top five strengths in a different way, maybe once a day for a week. And then for a challenge area, what can you do to build or exercise this as a character strength? So let's take a couple of minutes, take a look at page three in your handouts and see if you can come up with your top five, your bottom five and ways that you can exercise those differently than perhaps you already do. So we'll come back in about three minutes.
about a minute left. And if you could begin to wrap up your thought, we'll come back together. And welcome back. As you reflect and do some ongoing work around your strengths, areas that you can improve upon, talk to others about it. And part of the major theme of, of today as we think about uh, togetherness and working together is the idea that working together is better. We actually see more productive outcomes from even a research perspective. Uh, a couple of authors put together a recent publication to help support schools, and it's referred to as the New Team Habits. And there's a quote from the former president of Starbucks, Howard Baer, at the beginning of the publication, and it says, it's really a, a simple equation. Grow the people, you grow the organization and the organization grows the result. And when I think about what we've done in schools and what the authors kind of suggest to us is that we've actually been putting the emphasis in the wrong place. We've kind of been at actually either end of the spectrum at the bottom here. We've either been focusing in on individuals and trying to change individual people, or we've focused bigger picture on the organization and tried to shift and change the organization. And what the authors suggest is that if we focus in on teams, we're more likely to get to our outcome on a deeper level and more quicker, more quickly. And so really shifting that focus to the team level is critical for making both lasting change um, because that's really the basis for when new people come into the organization, how we induct them into the effective practices that we wanna see. So focusing on teams is gonna actually impact individuals within those teams, and it's also gonna impact the organization. And so I would encourage you as you sit on various teams across your buildings and as you think about school improvement um, or even department based, how do you want to use your teams as a structure to moving and changing both individuals and the organizations. If you want to take concepts around exploring your strengths and challenge areas further, I would recommend a couple of things. There's a a couple of great assessments above and beyond the VIA character strengths assessment, um, the DISC assessment for behavioral tendencies and the Myers-Briggs, which is more of a personality assessment. I did put a paper version of those in the Google Drive folder so you can see those. If you're more interested in exploring um, what, how teams can help uh, support effective growth, then I've uh, put some resources in everything from establishing norms to how you can periodically assess your teams, particularly if we're thinking about things like either PLCs, professional learning communities, or instructional data teams. And so with those team functioning practices, there's an opportunity for the teams to do a reflecting uh, around what, what are the team strengths and where can the team grow. The second key lever that I wanted to explore with you is this idea of biology and how uh, from a biological perspective, we can look at workplace environments. Uh, so I want you to do some reflecting over the course of this section and really think about not just the current environment of the buildings that you work in and in the Cromwell Public Schools, but also be thinking about other places that you've worked and what the kind of makeup has been like in relationship to the environment. So Simon Sinek wrote a book a number of years ago called Leaders Eat Last. And in this book, he talks about the complexity of the human body in relationship to chemicals um, within the body. He almost even refers to the fact that we're kind of like walking pharmacies. And so when we encounter various things in our environment, it actually has an impact on how well we work together. And he talks about specifically uh, things like happiness, pride, and joy. All of those things can actually increase our capacity and increase our productivity and the, the ability for us to be able to work together um, productively and effectively. Specifically, he describes five chemicals in the body, four of which he sees as kind of positive uh, chemicals that produce positive feelings or positive results. So endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. And these four chemicals coming into our bloodstream for different reasons at different times um, based on our actions and based on um, the environment. The, the fifth being cortisol. And this leading to kind of a, uh, that chemical response, the physiological response to fear and stress. And so when we have heightened levels of fear and stress, 
cortisol is pumped into the bloodstream, our adrenaline starts going, and so it kind of has that negative uh, biological uh, physical effect, but also it stops us from working well together as a team. And so to go a little bit further with this concept, specifically endorphins and dopamine are those chemicals in our body that help us to persevere, get things done, be innovative, achieve things. Um, and they tend to come into the body quickly and also leave the body quickly. But they also um, have a very strong uh, feeling that allows us to kind of want more of them. They're almost like an addictive quality. Specifically, endorphins are designed to mask pain. So some of you who exercise quite frequently and endurance and push yourself, um, the endorphins really help support um, your ability to, to stay strong and be able to continue with your patterns of physical endurance. We get endorphins from exercise, from physical labor, and also from laughter. And we don't really think about the endorphins uh, release from laughter, but it actually does. Dopamine, a little bit different, is actually a, a chemical that's released with the satisfaction of finishing a task. When we uh, progress or we accomplish things, when we attain something that we've worked hard for, and so completing a task, but also things like eating, social media, and of course, cocaine, nicotine, alcohol, gambling, Amazon shopping, you, you pick what you want, um, but those are ways that we can we release a dopamine into our bloodstream. Um, how many of you maybe make to-do lists, you probably have a huge one going for the start of the school year, right? And how many of you probably add things to your to-do list, even though you've already done them, just so you can cross them off and you feel good about it? That's a dopamine release. And technically you're actually self-medicating when you do that, um, but you feel good when you cross things off your list and that sustains over time. You also get that same feeling when you get a text or um, a social media indicator um, that you have a message. It means somebody's thinking about you and you start to feel good and you get that release of dopamine. If you post a picture on Facebook and you check a few minutes later and you get 10 likes, you get a shot of dopamine. A few minutes later, you get 20, 30, 40 more likes, you get another shot of dopamine. And that's one of the reasons why uh, social media and technology can be addictive. And also embarrassed to say, I probably have some Amazon deliveries occurring right now as we speak. And then the last piece around dopamine in terms of some interesting research actually comes from making our beds. Uh, so Admiral William uh, McRaven has uh, written a book and published uh, some work around his um, experience as a, as a Navy SEAL Admiral. And what he talks about is this idea of um, the dopamine release from making our bed. If we make our bed every morning, we've actually seen a correlation to better productivity because of that dopamine rush. So if you wanna change the world, start off every day by making your bed. The next two chemicals are serotonin and oxytocin. These aren't as quick coming in and leaving as the first two chemicals, and they're actually referred to as social chemicals. And the reason is that they actually require us to be around others in order for this release of serotonin and oxytocin. So um, incentivizing us to work together, helping to form bonds in the workplace, all of these uh, are a result of serotonin and oxytocin in our bloodstream. Specifically with serotonin, it's really about the feeling of pride and confidence. So when we see our colleagues getting acknowledged for Teacher of the Year, makes us feel good too. Um, it gives us a sense of pride, releasing some serotonin into our bloodstream. When someone we love or care about experiences that kind of serotonin boost, we get one too. With oxytocin, it's kind of referred to as the friendness, uh, friendship, love, and, and deep trust uh, chemical. And as Dan mentioned this morning about the symbolic hugs and how important hugging is, we actually in our house, if someone's looking a little sad or upset, we say, do you need a little oxytocin? And that means you want to hug. And how important it is for us, even if we're giving virtual hugs um, or symbolic hugs, to be able to feel like um, we're, we're getting what we need and releasing that oxytocin. It forms the bond. So that our brain kind of releasing it when we feel that connection to others. It's so critical. It actually has a positive impact on our immune system, makes us better problem solvers, and makes us more resistant to some of the addictive qualities of some of the other chemicals. So let me just kind of show you a visual image. And believe it or not, even just from watching this, you're going to feel better. <laughs>
you get the idea. Um, but you do feel better even just watching them and what they're doing is feeling good and they know it feels good so they keep doing it. Um, and that bond that they feel as well. And that happens in workplace environments. Another example is the biology behind random acts of kindness. And I know a lot of schools a number of years ago had gone through um, a kind of a process of incorporating this into their schooling. And in some cases it's kind of gone away. I would encourage you to bring it back. Here's what happens on a biological level when it comes to random acts of kindness. If I do something nice for someone else, I get a shot of oxytocin, I feel better about myself, the world, my connections with others. Um, also, the person receiving the act of kindness also gets a shot boost of oxytocin. And then anybody else who witnesses it or hears about it will also get a slight shot of oxytocin. And so that's really the contagious effect, but it also builds community and how important it is in our schools to build community. That fifth chemical, the chemical that we talked about was cortisol. It initiates the body's fight or flight system. Um, it really kind of produces strong feelings of anxiety, stress, and tension. And many of us kind of live in this world, especially through COVID. And they've actually done some research studies over the past year and a half of the amount of cortisol um, and adrenaline and bloodstreams as a result of stress that is pandemic related. It triggers the adrenaline release, high blood pressure, cognitive ability, glucose levels, everything, um, including suppresses sex drive. I probably should have started with that. And for those of you who weren't paying attention, you would have paid attention real quick. Um, yeah, cortisol has all these negative uh, impacts on the body. Um, what we also need to keep in mind is that when people don't feel safe, either COVID related or otherwise, if they don't feel comfortable being vulnerable, putting their weaknesses forward, it makes them less concerned about the organization and less concerned about other people. They kind of withdraw and go inward. And so we have a responsibility to look at opportunities for releasing the serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, and really find ways that we can take care of one another. So I'd like to also engage you in a very, very quick reflection, just a minute, jot down a couple of thoughts you have. Is there something that you feel that you could do as a school or as a grade level team or as a department or as a district to help take care of one another and yourselves? What's something that you could do to help relieve stress and feel connected to other people? Let's take a minute, jot down a couple of thoughts and at some point after today, present those ideas to your building administration or your grade level team or the group that you were thinking of. So let's take about one minute. Okay, let's begin to come back together. All right, and don't forget, after today, take those ideas and share them with others and see how you can put things into place that can help um, kind of minimize the effects of cortisol uh, being released into your our bloodstreams. We talked about the endorphin connection to laughter and researchers have actually found that, um, you know, there's a lot to learn about laughter, including the fact that it is contagious, number one. Um, and number two, it really helps strengthen our connection with one another. And I wasn't really kind of um, clear, I guess, on the degree to which laughter can be contagious. But let me show you this quick video clip and, and see if you can see why I might say that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> so I can't help but at least smile. And there's been times where I've watched this where I've started laughing, belly laughing, like so loud. And some of you might have been laughing watching the video and at the very least smiling. Um, and that's releasing those positive endorphins. But at the same time, it's also creating bonds and bringing people together. There's uh, more and more coming out in relationship to the neuroscience of smiling and laughing. And pay attention to it because it actually has some impact and you'll see some of the literature creeping up around how this impacts instruction and how this impacts our relationships with our students. So the smile is actually one of the most powerful tools that we can use in teaching. And that's a quote from John Hattie, who is a meta analyses kind of researcher who's looked at so many educational innovations and interventions. And he says that smiling is one of the most important things that we can do as educators. And the fact that it's infectious um, helps. Uh, even the release of endorphins occurs when we exercise the 80 plus muscles around the eyes, jaw, and temples that are associated with smiling. So if you're not happy and someone comes up to you and says, smile, just force a smile on your face. By forcing the smile, you also actually release those endorphins and start to feel better. And that's the kind of um, mirror neurons uh, in association of our, of our opportunities to exercise that through muscle movement, muscle memory. So the neuroscience of the smile in relationship to uh, students is critical. And one of the things that I've actually given teachers feedback on in relationship to uh, coaching interactions has been smiling. And I know sometimes if, uh, you know, learning walks are occurring or uh, observations are occurring or a coaching visit, you get nervous and maybe sometimes you don't smile. Um, but really think about the extent to which your students see you smiling. Um, and really, it sends strong messages to students about how approachable you are, as well as things like respect and so forth. And so really kind of take, take some time to do some reflecting about that. And that leads to the importance of relationships. And when I listen to your Teacher of the Year, Dan, talk about the stories from students, what kids have said, um, it really does speak to relationships. And there's been a ton of research around the importance of building and strengthening relationships. And the data that comes out of this research is saying, listen, our students are more able to accept rules and, and uh, routines and procedures of the classroom and of the school. They comply with redirection and actually accept discipline actions more uh, when they have that strong relationship with the teacher and the class climate. Likewise, though, if they don't feel that connection, um, there's, there are some challenges. So here's how important this is. When we measure the impact of something in schools or in education, we tend to use what we refer to as effect size research. And effect size is simply a standardized measure of how much gain uh, we think we can experience or lose as a result of any practice, including things like smiling and building relationships, but also things like co-teaching, um, questioning techniques, opportunities for academic discourse. So all of these educational interventions or innovations or practices, uh, we can look at the meta-analyses and determine an effect size, meaning if we do this, this is how likely we think it's going to positively impact kids. In the scale that is typically used, um, if we're talking about a 0, 0.0 or less, we're saying that's a negative effect. If you do this practice, it's not good for kids, don't do it. If it's 0.2 um, to 0.4, we're talking small to moderate effects, all the way 0.6 to higher is really about extreme positive effects. If we do this, it's going to increase student performance, achievement, um, and all sorts of other positive outcomes for kids. The meta-analyses that have been conducted around relationships is 0.72 effect size. And among secondary students, it's even greater at 0.87. So if we look at our effect size scale, we can see moderate to strong to extreme positive effects from engaging uh, differently with students and building and bridging relationships. The flip side is also true, that if students don't feel a sense of connectivity or belonging, or they feel disliked or disconnected, it's got a negative 0.19 effect size. And so that's going to extremely impact negatively um, students and their ability to perform, engage, and behave. A couple of districts that I've been working with have been collecting student uh, survey data. And one of the survey questions that they ask or a series of questions has been about a sense of belonging and connectivity. And overwhelmingly what they found, and they've even disaggregated this by race and ethnicity, is that black females more so than any other group, um, very quickly followed by Latinx females, as well as other racial groups, um, uh, uh, disproportionately feeling less connected and less of a sense of belonging. So we have a moral obligation to really examine and explore our ability to make sure that every single one of our students 
feels connected, and has that sense of belonging. In the Google Drive folder, I'm going to put a document that will share with you some teacher traits that students have identified that, that are really important to them. The first is they want to feel acknowledged. The second is they want to feel valued in our opportunity as the adults to express that value. Um, respect, not the I'm here, you're here, I'm the teacher, you're the student, but really um, promoting respect and fairness. Being real, kids want to feel that sense of that you're a real human being and also being open to humor and having fun. This is what kids are looking for, according to student surveys. And so pay attention to these six things, do some ongoing reflecting, and think about what your strengths are embedded within this list. If you're looking for more things that you can do, create a random act of kindness uh, program, either in your classroom, your grade level, or across your school. Smile, air hug, fist pump, do what you gotta do. Um, make each other laugh, and also make your bed. Um, you know, parents will be happy too, but yeah, caregivers, make your beds. Um, the third lever has to do with cultivating hope, efficacy, and positive self-talk, along with gratitude in looking at our states of what we call flow. This is a lot in connection to positive psychology. And it's another area where research and literature is just blowing up. Um, but I think it's something that we have to pay attention to, particularly in schools. And what I wasn't aware of was that the uh, research connected to things like hope, and I'm talking about quantitative research um, around hope has been incredible. And thinking about measuring people's levels of hope um, and then looking at and connecting their outcomes as a result of that measurement. So if we were to define hope, hope is a combination of two things, optimism or positivity and agency. And we've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years talking about the importance of student agency, which is really that we feel we are in control or can strongly influence our outcomes. So I can put goals in place, practices in place that are going to help me get to my goals. That's agency. And so when we combine optimism and agency, it's this idea that the future we think is going to be better than the present, and it's that I have the power to make it so. And they've done all sorts of studies around even um, uh, patients undergoing cancer treatments and, and other types of illnesses and the level uh, and degree of hope. So measurements of hope with some of the studies have had outcomes like for students, 12% increase in academic performance with heightened or higher levels of hope. 14% increases in work productivity for adults, 10% um, increase in overall happiness or ratings of life satisfaction. So if your hope scale is rated high, then we also see um, happiness and life satisfaction overall rated 10% higher. Hope very much relates to efficacy, which has been around for a while. We've talked about efficacy since probably the late 1970s. And in fact, there was a study, a literacy study that was done by Rand Corporation in the 1970s. And here's what they found. The best predictor of student literacy achievement was how confident the teacher was that he or she could teach students how to be good readers. Let me say that again. The best predictor of student success or achievement in reading was how confident the teacher was that he or she could teach students how to be good readers. That's about our belief. And it kind of goes back to our classic children's book, right? The Little Engine That Could. This was about, I think I can, I think I can. Um, and I love this quote from Henry Ford. He says, whether you think you can or can't, you're usually right. And our belief systems play very much into our actions and our behaviors. In fact, the definition of efficacy is our belief in our capacities or capability to execute the task that we're being asked to do. So if you're a counselor, a teacher, a principal, um, a cafeteria employee, custodian, do you believe that you can carry out the tasks that you're being asked to do? and be successful with it. Within schools, we have levels of individual efficacy levels, like each person, but then we also have collective efficacy levels. So each school perhaps could have their own level of efficacy or department or grade level. Um, and so we really have to pay attention to, do we believe that we have what we need and the capacity and the ability to do what we're setting out to do? Um, positive self-talk, there's a direct correlation between efficacy and self-talk. And in fact, most, um, I think it's something like 90% of adults report that they have this really strong inner voice. And in fact, some of the research is suggesting that we say between 300 and 1,000 words every minute to ourselves, some within our awareness and some without. But our efficacy and our self-talk actually uh, impacts our behavior. 
So much so that some researchers took a look at various elite armed forces. So above and beyond the Navy SEALs, they researched other armed force units and they said, well, why is it that the Navy SEALs are more successful with their outcomes in relationship to the missions that they're being asked to take on? And overwhelmingly, it wasn't brawn, physical strength or physical endurance. It came down to positive self-talk as the reason why the Navy SEALs have been so successful. So do we believe that we can be successful? Sean Aker, who has um, a couple of books out, my favorite is The Happiness Advantage. He talks about the fact that both educators and healthcare professionals kind of live in a world of deficit. We try to diagnose, find out what problems are. And because we spend a good part of our day in that diagnosis, what are the problems phase, we actually see the world around us that way as well. And we have to spend time kind of going back to positivity, using what we know from uh, positive psychology and trying to change our self-talk. And there are a couple of things that we can do to help us in kind of achieving that balance because it is important for us to diagnose challenges and figure out solutions. But at the same time, we have to make sure that it's not impacting um, our other interactions with our colleagues and students. So finding opportunities to express gratitude and in fact, regularly practicing gratitude has proven to show um, changes in people's positive emotions, productivity, um, capacity to work better together. So practicing gratitude has a tremendous impact on our performance. So I wanna ask you to do another quick reflection. This is on page nine, and we'll take about two minutes. Jot down some responses to as many of these prompts as you can on page nine. A person that you're grateful to have in your life, something you find comfort in. These are all things that we can connect to gratitude. So take a couple of minutes now and see if you can respond to these prompts on page nine. Okay, a little less than a minute. All right, and welcome back. Hopefully you were able to come up with a couple of responses to these prompts. Um, if you actually wanna get a good shot of oxytocin and serotonin, um, take a picture of this page. And in particular, the person that you articulated as someone that you're grateful for in your life, send them that picture and let them know that you're grateful for them in your life. Um, that's gonna go a long way for both you and for that other person. Um, during the pandemic, the first part of the pandemic, I should say, um, Yale and other institutions were offering tuition-free courses, a select number of courses, but I decided to enroll in one. And the course I enrolled in was called the Science of Well-Being. And so this is a Yale course, and the entire uh, series of lessons was actually on practicing savoring. Now, I was familiar with the word savor, but I hadn't really spent time thinking about what it meant and how do I do it. We all savor something right? Maybe it's that morning cup of coffee or that fresh air or hugging our kids. Whatever that is, we find something in our lives uh, worth savoring. And really practicing savoring is an opportunity for us to give more intentionality to it. Um, it's going to bring us more enjoyment, connectivity, and so forth, and make us more productive. So intentional savoring is the use of either your thoughts or actions to increase the feeling, the intensity of the feeling or the duration um, of that positivity based on what we experience when we savor what we savor. So a couple of thoughts, maybe it's your first cup of coffee, your morning hug, a nap, whatever it might be, 
let's see if we can use some of these techniques to enhance savoring, right? So first, it's about identifying what it is you savor. Next, it's about seeing if perhaps we can share it with somebody else. Although I'm realizing I have hot shower as one of the things that you might savor and it may be inappropriate for you to offer to share that with someone else, depending on who that someone else is. But you know what I mean. See if you can find ways that you can share the things that you savor. Um, stay present in that moment for a little bit longer and see how we can use these techniques um, to help support those feelings of positivity. So take another literally 30 seconds to a minute. What do you savor? And how can you more regularly identify that or in, intentionally bring that into your daily practice? What do you savor and what can you do to experience it more intensely or more frequently? Right, and welcome back. The last part of our third lever is about experiencing flow. And we've all experienced this from time to time in our life. And that's this incredible feeling um, that kind of time goes away and we're feeling in the moment and uh, we get this kind of rush of uh, positivity and strength and um, clarity. And it's this feeling of, of we're accomplishing great things. Um, when we talk about flow, we're not talking about progressive flow. And here's where I'll really date myself. And some of you hopefully remember this flow as well. This was probably the first flow I knew um, from Mel's Diner back in the day. But anyway, um, flow, we're talking about this flow. Uh, Mihai Chick sent Mihai and all of his work and research as a positive psychologist talking about and thinking about mental states. Where are we most um, uh, heightened in our performance? Where do we feel most energized? And almost that feeling like we are doing the work that we were called to do. Um, what he says is essentially, when we have heightened levels of challenge, yet we have the ability and the skill, so kind of back to the efficacy work, um, when we experience both of those simultaneously, high challenge, and high skill or support or ability, that's when we experience flow. And that's that upper right-hand quadrant of this diagram is heightened level of challenge, but our ability level is also high. And if we're experiencing perhaps low level of challenge and low level of ability, then we've got either sadness, depression, apathy. So really kind of thinking about where are we? And, and when I've worked with folks over the past year and a half, we've actually identified start of the pandemic, where did we feel? Where were we with our technology skills? Um, three months later, six months later, and so forth. And so you'll find yourself kind of moving around this, but when we kind of have those lessons that just take off, the technology works smoothly, the lesson was great, that's that good heightened feeling of flow. Um, and imagine all the endorphins and serotonin and oxytocin you're kind of releasing um, as you experience that flow. And we can do so with more intentionality. So a couple of things you can do to help with key lever number three, maintain a daily gratitude journal tons and tons of research on taking five minutes in the morning and five minutes in the um, afternoon or evening to just jot down a couple of thoughts. What are you grateful for in your life? Um, and a, kind of a reflection at the end of the day. Practicing intentional savoring, self-talk, and getting in that state of flow. Those are all things that we can do um, to help increase uh, that third lever. The fourth thing I want to encourage you to do, and we're going to start this now, but I think this probably needs to be some ongoing work which is about core values. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't spend a ton of time reflecting and thinking about things like my core values until probably the last 10 years. Um, but the important piece here is once we have an opportunity to reflect on our core values, how do we think about the intersection between our core values and the organization that we're a part of, in this case, Cromwell Public Schools? So the greater your alignment between your personal and the professional core values, the greater our commitment to that mission, the greater our satisfaction and the likelihood of success. And so what you'll find on page 11 is um, not an exhaustive list, but several core values. And I want you to ask yourself, um, which of these core values are most important to you? Now, I've always asked folks for years to kind of drill down and isolate maybe the top four core values for them. A woman by the name of Brene Brown has done some awesome work, um, has uh, really encouraged groups to drill it down to two core values. Not easy to do. 
if you're having trouble looking at this list and saying, wow, these 10 things are important, here's what I would suggest. First, go through this list and just identify the ones that are important to you. Then look at the ones that you've identified and see if you can drill it down to two to four core values. If you're having trouble, use these questions on the screen. Does this core value define you? Is it who you are when you're at your best? And my favorite question, is this the filter that I use to make tough decisions? And that can help you determine which of these would be your core values. I wanna take a significant amount of time to do this. So we're gonna come back in about four minutes, take some time, go through the list and see if you can come down to two to four core values that are most important to you. Okay, let's try to come back in about one minute. All right, and welcome back. So personally, I was pretty clear on one of them, but then I had two or three that I wasn't sure. So if this is a challenge for you, stick with it. See if you can isolate it down. You'll notice at the bottom of page 11, I ask you to look at your personal core values and then professionally. And Brene Brown also says, we can't separate those out actually, that we are who we are, whether we're at work or we're at home. And it's really difficult to kind of separate out personal and professional. But what we can do is look to the organization's core values. So when I look at your district statements, like your mission statement, your vision, your belief statements, we can pick out words that would connect to core values. And I have to say, your vision and your belief statements are loaded with values, core values. Um, I did this in a, a, a district about a week and a half ago. And when I went through their district vision, mission, and belief statements, I didn't see a lot there. There wasn't a lot to work with. Your statements are absolutely loaded with core values, um, which speaks to, I think, the, the importance that you've placed as a district on this work. Um, what you see on the screen is a different list of words, but there's a ton of overlap between the first list that I asked you to wrestle with or work with. These words actually come directly from your district vision, mission, and belief statements. In addition, your um, draft portrait of a graduate documents, your attributes for what you would like to see with students as they um, graduate Cromwell schools. And so with that, I want you to see, was there and where is there a connection between what you felt were your personal core values and the district's core values? 
it may be explicit, like word for word in some cases, like I had respect on mine and respect is up here. Um, it may not be explicit, but there could be kind of a secondary connection. So if this is important to me, here's how it plays out in relationship to Cromwell Public Schools. So on page 12, we're gonna do a two minute reflection. See if you can come up with ways that your personal core values connect with that of Cromwell Public Schools. About a minute left. And let's begin to come back together. So hopefully you had an opportunity and saw some strong connections across your personal values and that of the organization. And as I've said, the more connection that we see, um, the more likely we are to be able to meet our vision and mission um, and also help in supporting each other to do that. Uh, there are two final reflections that I'm going to ask you to do at a later date, um, and these are kind of the things you can do after um, aspects, and that is this. Uh, respond to these two very similar yet slightly different questions. The first is this. If the people you work with found a sheet of paper with your core values on it, without your name, would they know they were yours? And the second related question, if the people you work with found your values on a sheet of paper with your name at the top, would they agree? based on the actions that they see every day. And one activity that I've asked uh, folks to do over time is to try to articulate based on each of your core values, what are the specific behaviors that people might experience or see that would indicate that that's a value to you. And there has to be some type of behavioral connection between our core values um, or else we might question whether or not that is indeed a core value. Um, so really kind of be thinking about your actions, your behaviors, and how they kind of manifest your, your core values. The last of our um, levers is really about the social emotional needs of ourselves, as well as for those around us. And when we look at the social emotional learning wheel to the right, we see everything from self-management, self-awareness, relationship skills, a lot of things that we've been talking about over the course of this morning. And in fact, most of what we do has some strong connection to social emotional learning and well being, which is why one of the things that I am challenged with in schools and districts is when social emotional learning is an add on or something that's separate from what we do. Um, so having that kind of social emotional hour is great. But what about the other um, time periods over the course of the day or the year um, when social emotional learning is just as necessary and needs to be supported. So really thinking about ways that we almost use social emotional learning aspects as a lens for addressing everything that we do. We also tend to think specifically about the social emotional learning of our students, but in this case, especially coming off of last year and going into this year, I'm convinced that we also need to think about our own social emotional learning needs 
um, and that of our colleagues. And so really kind of reflecting, and it all goes back to relationships, which has been a theme from the other speakers this morning um, through now, is the importance of positive connectivity and the importance of people being able to feel connected to one another and what that does to climate and or, uh, overall uh, work uh, uh, capacity and progress and growth and achievement. So this integrated approach to wellness includes a bunch of different factors, everything from social emotional learning to behavioral health, curriculum and instruction, things that we wouldn't necessarily see as connected or related. But when I gave you the example of students who don't feel a strong sense of connectivity or belonging, and in fact, in this particular district, um, the story was we were looking at um, for, through a racial equity lens, uh, disaggregating achievement data, attendance data, all sorts of data. And when we did so and disaggregated it by race and ethnicity, we found some interesting things. But I think the message to the group was I could put strategies in place to support things like attendance or school discipline or maybe even engagement. But what I wondered was what if we looked at putting strategies in place to address connectivity and a sense of belonging, maybe it would actually take care of some of the school discipline, some of the attendance challenges, and some of the engagement issues. And so really think about particularly um, with not being able to physically touch, um, with having to wear masks, um, what opportunities do we have to make our students feel connected? and have those conversations with your colleagues, have those conversations as a school community. Um, the aspects around social emotional learning are critical. And so take time to take care of yourself and those around you. Uh, find opportunities to even go back to earlier um, messages around what do you save or what do you need? Um, how do you build those and strengthen those healthy relationships? So the four or five uh, key levers to getting better was an opportunity for us to think about a foundation. If we wanna improve our practice around curriculum and instruction, if we wanna improve any practice that we take on, to what degree are these five factors or five key levers gonna help support that and how important these things are in what we do um, as schooling. So just by way of some final either words of encouragement or thoughts as we close our session this morning, um, I could very well close it out, but I think this uh, little youngster could do it better. And this is just a random YouTube video that I found, um, but I think this youngster kind of sums it up. I feel, I feel. Do you feel alive? I feel, I feel, I feel happy of myself. I feel happy of yourself too. What do you got, any words of wisdom? What about for all the other kids trying to learn how to ride their bike? Can you say anything to them? Everybody, I know you can believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, you will know how to ride a bike. If you don't, you just So if this kid doesn't understand efficacy and the importance of having a positive outlook and good belief system, but also the importance of relationships uh, and working together. So thank you all for your time this morning. Um, I also want to, um, again, thank uh, um, Dr. Macri and Dr. McLean for this opportunity. Um, and as your kids are coming back over the next couple of days and as you're getting your classrooms ready, um, think about these five key levers. Uh, take care of each other and um, I'm, I'm just so excited for, for this school year for you and uh, thank you very much. Take care everybody. Thank you Dr. Cormier for your informative presentation and your insightful wisdom. We truly appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today and for those of you that have met Dave in person, you know how engaging he is. So it was really difficult for all of us to make this decision today. Um, but we hope in the near future, we will all be able to sit in this room together and have um, Dave come back. I sincerely wish Makai and Anisha and Alicia a great school year. It's hard to believe that those little babies that walked into the door are um, in high school. 
and one's going to be graduating from high school. <laughs> um, give them my love. And this is why they are why we do this work. I can't thank you enough, Dave, for being such a good friend, a great resource to all of us and a colleague. So have a wonderful school year to you and your children. And I'm sure we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. I also would like to take a moment before we move on to thank everyone who was instrumental in helping today be successful. Dr. McLean has worked tirelessly with the leadership team, the curriculum leadership team, the administration, to really think in very carefully about what is needed in Cromwell Public Schools. And we can all truly use some time to be kind to ourselves and really reflect on what we need to do to make ourselves healthy and happy so that we can do the best for our children. It is a very difficult time and I don't want to pretend that it isn't. However, we have done an amazing job over the last year, 18 months, I should say. And I am confident that we will continue to do a great job. We're going to have to adjust and pivot and make changes as they come. But the most important thing is that we stay healthy and that our students are healthy. I want to thank, of course, my administrative assistant, Lisa Hicks, she's incredible. She cares very deeply about this community and the success of this community. Today could not be possible without her help, without the help of Alessandra Corvo, everyone at central office, all of our administrative assistants, custodial staff, and everyone that has been working so tirelessly throughout the summer, our administration, our teachers, our paras, our nurses, our support staff, our parents, our board of education. There are so many people that we need to thank and I'm sure I'll forget someone, um, but most importantly, if we did not have an incredible IT team, we would not have been able to make this happen today. So thank you to the IT team. May you all have a wonderful and healthy school year. I look forward to the days when we can walk by each other and share visible smiles. But for now, we will smile with our eyes and our hearts. Have a great school year, and Dr. McLean and I will be around to say hello. Um, and I couldn't think for a better staff, and I wish you the very, 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 very best this year and always. Have a great day and a great week next week when all of our kids come back to school. <laughs>